This week on Little Wars TV, we're sneaking into France for the greatest raid of World War II. In fact, probably the greatest raid in all of military history. Is Keith downstairs in the basement creeping around with a machine gun? Yes, uh, pretty much. Best to let him be. <laughs> in this episode, we'll set up the port of St. Nazaire in 28mm scale. Can our British players successfully storm the submarine base to eliminate a series of dockyard objectives, or will they be captured by the Germans? But before we get to the war game, Tom and I debate whether the St. Nazaire raid deserves to be called the greatest raid of all. Today's episode is sponsored by a game I've played since release, World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play, multiplayer, online game of intense naval action, where you can assemble a massive fleet from over 300 iconic warships, including the HMS Campbelltown from the raid on San Nazar. You can captain everything from aircraft carriers down to destroyers in highly detailed environments that model almost everything, including weather. Now, I enjoy World of Warships because it's the perfect balance of action and strategic gameplay and is very much a thinking man's game. Victory doesn't depend on who has the quickest trigger finger, but on knowledge of your ship and proper tactics. Because every battle's different, and there are a constant stream of special missions and events, the action never gets old. If you're ready to join over 30 million people playing World of Warships, click on the link in the description below to create a free account and enter the code BATTLESTATIONS2020 to receive some extra goodies courtesy of World of Warships that include in-game currency and a free premium American cruiser, the USS Charleston. Hopefully I'll see you in-game soon, but for now, let's get back to the show. I guess we're not going to France for this episode, huh? Uh, f***ing Steve Blue, the entire travel budget going to Africa. <laughs> the origins of the St. Nazaire raid can be traced back to May 1941, when the German ships Bismarck and Prince Eugen managed to sink the HMS Hood off the coast of Iceland. The British were stunned by the loss of what had been long considered one of their most powerful warships. But the British did exact some revenge for the Hood. That's right. Just a week later, they managed to uh, intercept and sink the Bismarck. The Bismarck had been en route to the French-occupied port of St. Nazaire, the only Atlantic dry dock capable of repairing large German battleships. The threat of the Bismarck may have been eliminated, but her sister ship, the Tirpitz, was even bigger. When she set sail in 1941, the Tirpitz would be the heaviest battleship ever constructed by a European Navy, outclassing any British vessel. With the loss of the hood still fresh in their minds, the British Admiralty was obsessed with eliminating the new threat. That's right, up until then, the Tirpitz had been training in the Baltic Sea under the protection of air cover. Right, and if it actually did manage to break out into the Atlantic, it would wreak havoc on the Allied shipping fleets. Which brings us back to St. Nazaire. The Royal Navy and Royal Air Force jointly concluded that without the safe harbor of St. Nazaire, the Germans would never risk sending their most powerful ship to the Atlantic. The British considered a variety of scenarios to destroy the St. Nazaire dry dock. Aerial bombing and naval bombardment were considered too infeasible. Well, and that left just the elite British commandos of the Special Operations Executive. And the sheer size and the weight of the dry dock meant the commandos couldn't carry enough explosives with them. Instead, they concocted a wild idea. They would pack an old British destroyer with 4.5 tons of explosives and literally ram the gates with the suicide ship. This is basically a British kamikaze strike. Yeah, as close as it gets. Uh, they figured they had time to uh, set the charges on a time delay and then do their raid, blow some things up, and then escape. How would they escape without the destroyer? Oh, well, about that. <laughs> The British planned to attack the port under the cover of darkness and thought their commandos could escape on a number of small unarmored motorboats that would accompany the destroyer. This doesn't strike me as the most thought out part of the plan. No, I mean it's definitely the weakest part of the plan and it would soon prove pretty disastrous. At 1 a.m. on March 28, 1942, 600 British troops slipped up the Loire River and landed in St. Nazaire under heavy German fire. The HMS Campbelltown rammed the dry dock gate and groups of commandos fanned out across the port to destroy a series of strategic targets. The nighttime raid actually knocked out the dry dock, which achieved their goals. How many commandos escaped? Well, only about a third got away. Uh, most of the small motorboats were destroyed by the Germans, and uh, there's no way out. At noon the next day, long after the Germans thought the raid was over, and when in fact a few Germans were on the ship looking for souvenirs, the HMS Campbelltown exploded on a time delay. It wrecked the dry dock for the duration of the war. In British military circles, the St. Nazaire raid became legendary, known as the greatest raid of all. But was it really? I mean, it, 
achieved every tactical objective. Except for getting the men home safely, and strategically it achieved nothing. The purpose of the raid was to keep the Tirpitz from breaking out into the Atlantic. What the British didn't know is that months before the raid, the Germans had already decided to send the Tirpitz to Norway. They didn't want to lose her like they lost the Bismarck. The Tirpitz was never going to the Atlantic anyway. The British lost two-thirds of their men on a risky operation that served little strategic value. The loss of the dry dock was a major blow to the Germans, even without the Tirpitz in play. And it's hard to imagine some bolder objectives. I could name you a few uh, alternatives. How about the German paratrooper attack on the Belgian fortress at Ebenemal? It's the first major paratrooper operation in history, and it's both tactically and strategically successful. Or what about Operation Oak, where the Germans land gliders on top of a mountain to rescue Mussolini? All without even firing a single shot. Well, those are both great raids, but to be fair, they're not British operations. <laughs> okay, well, I'll give you two British examples. Okay. Operation Flipper was just as daring as Saint Nazar, if not more so. British commandos slipped behind German lines in North Africa on board a submarine to try and assassinate Erwin Rommel. Bold? Yes. No, but Flipper was both a tactical fiasco and a strategic failure. All right, you want an apples to apples comparison. Mm -hmm. How about a British nighttime raid on a major port? On the night of November 11th, 1940, the Royal Navy launches a surprise torpedo bomber raid on the Italian fleet harbored at Taranto. The British lost just two biplanes, while the Italians lost three battleships and a heavy cruiser, half their capital ships in the fleet. The British attack at Taranto was the first of its kind and a smashing success, one that would serve as a model for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor a year later. Okay, you know what? I'll, I'll give you that. Uh, Toronto was definitely a contender for the greatest raid of World War II. But right now, it's time for us to get inside and set up the Port of St. Nazaire in 28mm scale. Almost all the terrain you see here is printed from STL files sold by Jens from 3D Print Terrain. We've purchased a number of his downloadable files and they work great for historical wargaming. And if you're still on the fence about jumping into 3D printing, be sure to check out Steve's multi-part series for beginners. In today's game, we'll be using Bold Action 2nd Edition World War II rules. And if you're interested in a rules review, check back next week where we go over it in detail. Tom and Miles, you two will be playing the British Commandos in our game today. Your commander groups must set demolition charges at the pump house and the winding hut, the two facilities that control the operation of the dry dock gate. Your secondary objectives are to knock out the German gun positions, and if you're really lucky, try to sink the U-boat. Dave and I will be the Germans defending the dockyard. Our naval brigade represents elements of the nearly 5,000 German troops defending the harbor, heavily armed with anti-aircraft guns. St. Nazaire was an important German U-boat pen, and a number of small German craft were tied up in the basin that night. The Germans must capture or kill all the British commandos before they do further damage to the port. Okay, let's break up into our teams and discuss strategy. It's going to be a tough mission there, Tom. It is. I, I, don't, uh, I don't have a lot of hopes of getting guys back to Spain. No, <laughs> no. We may get maybe more than five that historically made it there, but, yeah. but probably not a lot more. Yeah. So I'm coming on the uh, Normandy dock. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe you're coming on across the... Across, uh, the, across the channel there, yeah. uh, into the town part. Good. Uh, there are six objectives. We have to destroy four of them. We've identified them. The Germans don't know which ones. Tom has three on his side. I have one on mine. So Tom has the bulk of the demolition teams. Uh, I, my, my troops will give their lives for you, Tom. Well, likewise. Right back at you. <laughs> for king and crown. <laughs> you ready for this, Keith? Uh, what now? <laughs> Never ready. I'm as ready as I'm going to get. Uh, I think our basic plan is to, the defense force is going to try to hold the pump house and the winding hut, but we're going to put a heavy machine gun on top of the pump house, see if we can hold that as long as possible, and then we're going to put another heavy machine gun up in one of the buildings that overlooks that area so we could cover each, each other. Um, and other than that, I think we're going to rely on luck of where our patrols land and try to... Yeah, because your patrols will be randomly distributed across the board, so you don't know where they're going to be at the start of the game. And we, True, and we also don't know where the British are going to come on either, so right. that, that it's all just going to be luck, I think. Right, and my about. relief force doesn't show up until turn two. Yeah. Um, we come in rolling in in trucks, some yeah. Opel blitzes. Um, so we should be able to get there quick. But one would hope, unless I get machine gunned. Because that one road leads right down yeah. to where we need to be. Yeah, so it'll really depend where they are. And then there's that choke point. Yeah. across the canal, which we're going to have to make sure that we defend that. Yeah. So Keith, I was looking at the miniatures upstairs on the table. Yeah. They look really nice. So oh. what, what company are they? Or Oh, thanks. Did um, you paint them? I painted the Germans. Um, they are a combination of artisan designs and Crusader miniatures. Uh, the Brits are mostly uh, Crusader 
Uh, some of the, the commandos are artisan, and then the uh, remaining British forces, crusader. Well, hopefully they fight as well as they look. Oh, thank you. Players in today's war game will focus on the area near the Normandy dry dock to contest the most critical objectives of Operation Chariot. On this six foot by eight foot tabletop, the Germans have four patrols randomly distributed to start the game. Keith is also allowed to deploy two heavy machine gun teams anywhere he chooses. The British have two primary objectives, but must also take at least two of the four secret secondary objectives. They target the German officer's quarters and the U-boat repair shop. The commandos have just eight turns to set demolition charges. To begin the game, the British roll to see when each of their teams lands on shore. Tom gets off to a great start and rolls well for availability, with over half of the commandos disembarking on turn one. The British immediately set foot on the dock under heavy German fire and dash towards the winding point. You're gonna assault your team? Well, at what point can we ambush you? Uh, if you can see me from oh, here, we you, can see you. You, you. We're moving, so you can stand fire. We're firing. We're firing. Nice. Right. <laughs> Reveal where your oh, machine gun is. Yes. On top of the pump house. All right. <laughs> You're going to get hard cover. Five dice. It's half range. Half so range. Eighteen or less. You point blank. So plus one. These guys are in hard cover. Minus two. We have five hits. All right. Ooh. A five or six is a kill. Okay. One kill. Oh, and it's a six, so Ooh. roll it again. If you roll six again, they may be able to pick. Nice. Ah! So, <laughs> whoever's important, I don't give a shit who it is. <laughs> you, you can choose the light machine gunner the squad or the leader. squad leader. The squad leader. All right. Squad leader's done. All right, Tom, you're still going in though. All right. Hey, two dead. All right. So that's the team. Well, there goes the pump house. <laughs> it's the very opening move of turn one, and Tom has already stormed the winding hut, but at great cost. Keith realizes the pump house may be more vulnerable than expected and rushes his harbor patrols towards the British. The race for the pump house is on. But perhaps that's exactly the response the British hope to provoke. The British wait until the end of turn one for Miles to land his commandos on the opposite side of the basin entrance, where Keith has mostly vacated. The British now have a strong foothold on both halves of the table. German fortunes grow dimmer still on turn two. Hurrah! When Dave rolls poorly to bring fresh German reinforcements into action. It's a rough start for the German garrison. Miles charges ahead and forces the Germans to take cover inside the officers' quarters. I got three shots. Gift for you, Hans. Three <laughs> shots, hitting on fives. Okay. Oh. Two hits. Nice. If I, get, if I go down to pistols, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> Come on. Two kills. Oh, Two pins. With Dave's reinforcements still coming up, Keith has been pummeled by Miles. Worse yet, he can see swarms of Tom's commandos on the other side of the table, ready to storm the pump house objective. On the winding hut, Tom is already planting his first demolition charge. Near the end of turn two, Keith makes a major tactical decision that will set the course for the rest of the game. He decides the race for the pump house is now a lost cause and instead pulls back his patrols to consolidate a new defensive position around the bridge choke point in the middle of the table. Will conceding the northern half of the table to Tom's commandos prove prudent or disastrous? On turn three, Dave's reinforcements finally roll well enough to arrive, and it's not a moment too soon. They start filtering on as a trickle, but soon pour on the table by the truckload. The German garrison nearly doubles in strength. Tom and Miles realize time is not on their side. But at this critical moment in the scenario, the luck of the dice tilts heavily in favor of the British. Units in bolt action activate when their color die is randomly pulled from a bag, and early in turn three, all the dice are coming up British. Tom takes advantage of the situation to rush inside the pump house and plant his second demolition charge. Keith's decision to vacate this half of the table means Tom's commandos can fan out across the port. On the other half of the table, 
Miles takes advantage of the British initiative to attempt capturing the heavily defended German officers' quarters, one of the British secret secondary objectives. All right, I'm going to assault. He's driving that riddle. <laughs> I'm going to assault your team in here. Okay. Would you like to shoot at me? Sure. All right. Would you pull out a blue die? And you're going to hit on fives. Uh, the submachine gun, I think. You got submachine six dice. The battle for the officers' quarters hangs in the balance until the activation dice finally start coming up. German. Hey, I'll take one. All right, uh, the flak is going to shoot. Oh, wow, there's nobody to shoot at. You can try to disable what the hell over there. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Two shots. What do I hit on? Not that. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that. <laughs> Keith's luck with the 88mm gun may be poor, but Dave's heavy stream of reinforcements makes up for it in a big way. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> what am I hitting on? Fours. Fours? German squads counterattack against Miles and pin down the commandos with heavy losses on both sides. The fight on this half of the table is ferocious. But on the other side, a massive explosion echoes across the port. The winding hut is destroyed. I think it's going okay. I think we've gotten three of the major objectives we want, and mm -hmm. it's going to be 50-50 if we get that critical fourth one. Yep, you're right, you're right. But that was a great plan to really occupy them over there yeah, in the I, uh, town side of the uh, quay. And uh, meanwhile, I've been working up slowly, but mm -hmm. still in yeah. a good position. Now, I'm going to shift my focus just to fire on the troops opposing you and Perfect. try to pile up the pins. That. It's all for you, Tom. Thank That's you. That's why we're here. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to get your guys up, and I think it's a bum's rush to see if we can get that fourth charge placed and get to victory. All right. Well, you know, we have a number of squads, the British commandos with uh, submachine guns. Right. And uh, I did not know this, but maybe you did. Uh, the, they didn't have a submachine gun in the British Army up to that point. No, they, the Stens were just being issued just prior to the raid, so they actually didn't have any in the raid now. Some of our miniatures for the Eagle Eye will have Stens, don't <laughs> yell at us. They actually had all these Thompsons, and not just any Thompson, the 1928 the Thompsons, 28, so gangster yes, Thompsons. That's right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a hefty gun. Yeah. Uh, this is not a hefty gun, it's actually stamped metal. It feels quite cheap. This is a real Sten, and in fact, both these guns you're going to see in a future video, we're going to take them to the range and show you what it's like to fire them. Excellent. I look forward to that. Uh, so, Keith, how have things been going on your flank? Well, we just lost both of the main objectives, which is not that surprising. Right, that would happen. Yeah. In yeah. hindsight, I think we should have kept the machine guns out of those. Uh, yeah. I, I think given the way the scenario was set up, we were doomed to lose those right away. So we just kind of threw the MGs away. Now, I think we're in a decent position to hold the rest of the objectives. Tom has a lot of troops coming up your flank, though. Yes, although I have the 20 millimeter gun and two small units kind of set on ambush. I don't think we're in a bad place, <laughs> yeah. um, but we haven't been killing as many Brits as I would have hoped. Yeah. With all the heavy weapons we have on the table, it just doesn't seem like any of it's effective. Right. At the start of turn four, the Germans have achieved a formidable concentration in the middle of the table and are pressing miles on the southern flank to contest the officers' quarters. But this leaves Tom freedom to manoeuvre his way around the last objective. Tom's commandos have a lot of ground to cover, but they race through the shadows of the warehouse district against no German opposition. Keith is content to wait in ambush positions and allow Tom to come to him. On the other side of the harbour, Miles and Dave trade blows for control of the officers' quarters. Eventually, the superior training and veteran status of the British gives them tenuous but temporary control over the objective, just long enough for Miles to plant a demo charge. But Dave is determined not to let Miles detonate it. If he can drive off the commandos, the bomb could potentially be disarmed. Over the next two turns, Dave calls up fresh German troops and attempts to storm the officers' quarters repeatedly. All right, so I got seven dice, hitting on threes. Now that I like. Holy uh, mackerel. Six hits. There's no saves in assault. Now yeah. the whole squad goes. I know, put these in the recycling bin. 
Those are your casualties. All right, and I'm, and I'm done for the turn. British commandos under Miles sell their lives dearly. Overwhelming German reinforcements finally recapture the house, and just as they do, the demolition charge explodes. The blasters soon echoed across the harbour when Tom's planted charges at the pump house successfully detonate as well. At the end of turn six, the British commandos have wrecked three of their four targets, leaving Tom and Miles in a rather celebratory mood, but capturing the last objective may prove to be a bridge too far. Keith and Dave have turned the middle of the table into a fortress and are ready to stake their chances at victory on holding out until the turn limit expires. With time running short, the British formulate a desperate plan. The U-boat repair shop is now too heavily defended by waves of fresh German troops, but another secondary objective, the German 20mm AA gun, is within reach. But for Tom to take this objective, he will have to leave the safe shadows of the factory district and dash across open ground into the teeth of prepared German defences. The British are nearly out of time, and it's now or never. Tom dashes for the 20mm gun. German machine guns open up from multiple directions. Keith has a squad in ambush positions, defending a brick building on the other side of the basin entrance to cover the objective. Brits in the open. Two hits. Two hits. Put a pin on those Brits. As multiple commando squads rush forward under fire, Dave disembarks more Germans from nearby train cars to trade fire at point blank range. The British are cut down. One squad is pinned and another shot to pieces. But the swarming veteran commandos will not be denied. A brave team ducks behind the 20mm anti-aircraft gun and plants the last demo charge in the final desperate moments of turn eight. All right, well, it's at the end of turn eight and game's over. And we'd like to know what were the British objectives that you picked? Well, we, we got three of our four major objectives, which was the winding hut and the pump house. We also got the, uh, the officer's quarters. We did not get the sub pen, which was our, our fourth one. Uh, so getting three of our objectives was three points. And then we got the, uh, the uh, anti-aircraft position as the charge was about to go off. So that's half point. Three and a half points is a minimum win. So it is a very slim victory for us. Well, it felt like a major British victory because we took a pounding. You know, when I first got off the boat uh, and I see the machine gun emplacements there and the coverage from here, it looked like it was going to be very challenging, but they actually went away fairly quickly, which I think is just yeah. part of the rules. Well, and you used the factory as, as cover, which was a good advance. Yeah, I was actually yeah. kind of creeping around over here until our final surge out you of were, the factory. You were skulking in the shadows for most of the game. Yeah, yeah. that's a good commando does. Yeah, that's it's right. true. That's it is dark. It's all about timing. It's about, it was, it launched that assault at the very end. It was great. For you. Yeah. Well, the other situation is the fact that you had fairly inexperienced yeah. troops yes. against veterans, and so right. even when you did get to get into a firefight, yeah. you were on the losing end of that. And I had rifles and submachine guns. So that's, yeah. that's right. And he had British pluck. <laughs> British pluck. I also like to point out that the British are well placed to mm. escape on one boat. Yeah. And then we're close enough, we're going to. Come in. You're going to take that stuff? Take, <laughs> take that for a spin. We, we didn't want to tell you that because it might be rubbing it in. It was a gorgeous table. Yeah. So it's, yeah. The table yeah. Great. It was a lot of fun to play on this table. I, I like that most of this, almost all of this 3D printed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Good game. Good game. Yeah, it was a good game. Heck of a good game. <laughs> good defense, Dave. You did more than I did. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Little Wars TV, brought to you by World of Warships. If you'd like to try the game, click on the link in the description below so you can set up your free account. And if you enter the code BATTLESTATIONS2020, you'll get a whole slew of free stuff to get you started. Thanks for watching today, and we'll see you next time here on Little Wars TV.